Okay, good morning, everybody. And uh, in New York, good morning, and in Beirut, good afternoon. Um, I'm Rami Khouri in New York at the AV office with our staff and guests and our guest speakers, and I'm happy to welcome you all for another AUB New York City briefing. The topic today is political and social theater in the Arab region. And we have a panel of three people in New York and a group in Beirut uh, with one moderator and commentator as well. So uh, we will get started here. And the speakers will be Robert Myers, who's professor of English and director of the Al-Walid Center for American Studies uh, at AUB and co-director with Sahar Asaf, who's our other speaker here, co-director of the theater initiative at AUB. And they both have many years of experience doing quite innovative uh, theater work, teaching, and productions uh, in Beirut and in the US. And, and they'll tell us all about that. Um, so Robert will speak, then Sahar will speak. She's an actress, stage director, and assistant professor of theater at the American University in Beirut, uh, and has, uh, is, is co director of the AUB Theater Initiative, has been active in many theater initiatives in the region as well as here in, in New York, which she tells about. And then Lori Latham will be our discussant here. Lori has um, uh, many years of work in theater uh, and art education. She's director of the Moment Work Institute at Tectonic Theater Project. It's an initiative she has launched, which she'll tell us about. Uh, and then we will go to Beirut, where we will have uh, Sani Abdelbahi, who is uh, moderating and anchoring the group in uh, Beirut. And he's a part-time faculty at the Lebanese American University in Lebanon and has uh, worked in uh, many different aspects of drama and theater in Lebanon, uh, London, uh, Tunis, and many other cities and countries around the region. So we are very pleased to uh, have you with us. And we will start with uh, initial comments from our three speakers here, and then Sunny, and then we'll open it up for a discussion um, in Beirut and New York. Robert. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you to everybody here at uh, AB and New York. It's really wonderful to see all of you here, and I'm really happy that this has afforded the opportunity for us to uh, have a venue here in New York since I spend about half my life here and half in Beirut of the connections, and they're very real, and thank you for uh, having this forum to reinforce it. Uh, thanks so much to Lori, especially, for coming. I know she's coming in for this uh, huge event she'll tell you about that Tectonic did, the 20th anniversary of the Laramie Project, their sort of groundbreaking uh, play. So it's really wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see uh, our friends in uh, Beirut, uh, Nada Saab, uh, my uh, translating collaborator, Sunny Abubaki, who's worked with us uh, on a number of projects. Pascal, who worked with us on um, uh, Blood Wedding. It's lovely to see you. Um, and Medium, uh, uh, Ayers, who's uh, also worked with us extensively here. It's very nice to see you all. Um, let me begin uh, by uh, just giving you a very quick overview of how the theater initiative came into being. Uh, what took place, and uh, in come some others uh, in Beirut. It's wonderful to see some of the people we've worked with. Um, our uh, collaboration, uh, uh, the collaboration that Sahar and I uh, began, uh, started in 2013. Uh, Tom Kim, who uh, is still at AB, who is uh, um, a, a quite extraordinary uh, conductor um, and was the chair of fine arts, uh, came to me and said, um, we have this uh, um, uh, person who's teaching theater in uh, our department. I think you should work with her. And so I did, I communicated with Sahar. We did not know each other, though I did see on YouTube, and I highly recommend it. She has a, a documentary film on female fighters during the Lebanese Civil War, a documentary film um, that was shown in a variety of places. And uh, so I saw an interview of her talking about it, and I immediately became very interested in her and her work because it's such a fascinating subject. And uh, we got together and we talked about what we might do. Um, I had just written a play on drone pilots, which was subsequently um, adapted. I adapted it for BBC Radio. It was done 
in uh, Taos uh, and Santa Fe at a theater there. It's been done in a couple of other places. And uh, I said, well, maybe we could do this. Or Sah uh, Sahar and I uh, uh, instead uh, chose a project that Nada, who's sitting next to Sunny Beirut, and I uh, were working on, which was a play by the uh, very renowned Syrian playwright Sabal Awanus, Tukus al Sharab wa uh, Rituals of Science and Transformations. It's a really groundbreaking uh, play that was written in the 1990s, and um, just fortuitously, uh, Nada and I had received a MacArthur Foundation grant with a theater in. Uh, Chicago to uh, to uh, translate the play with no expectation that it would really get produced. Um, and uh, it turned out that Sahar, of course, knew um, the play, knew the work, and went, oh, let's do this. And it's a huge play. It's a Shakespearean play. So it's not like we started with something, started little and got big. We started enormous. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, we had no money. We had no theater, we had no money, we had no infrastructure. Um, all we had was um, a deep desire to um, make theater central to the uh, educational experience at AB. And what we tried to do is lure some of the people in the room here, <laughs> or uh, others, uh, uh, into working with us. And so what we did was we developed a model at the university, which was a production class. It existed on the books. But what we did was we went, let's turn this into a sort of European style uh, production uh, conservatory experience where you will sit uh, in class and what you will do is, and we curated it. We had people come in and talk about the Arab city, who talked about the role of uh, women in the 19th and 20th century, who talked about Manus, who talked about the theory of space. Um, we then had the idea that it would be enormously helpful for our students to um, uh, have mentors, as it were, for the different designers. So um, we hired people um, who were professionals, a lot of them working in a number of industries, including uh, theater, and they would come in and say, well, um, I'm a costume designer, um, and I also do fashion, uh, I had a show in Milan, I do this, I do music videos for money, but this is uh, my passion. So they would talk about how they had a life, how they you know, were able to sustain themselves, but also um, their theory about costume design or stage design or whatever. And um, essentially well, what Saha did uh, is as the director, she was the director and my role was, and it just kind of organically evolved this way, um, uh, I was the dramaturg and producer. Uh, so that meant I went around with a tin cup begging people for money and crying and uh, trying to get the uh, little uh, uh, mechanisms in the bureaucracy that we're not used to this kind of project to explain to them why uh, you would need to pay Ahmad the carpenter you know, uh, $75 today, and I need the money, and I've got to do it, and it depends on, well, we need to, you know, we need to send out bids or whatever, you know. It, um, uh, so a, a lot of it was trying to change the culture a little bit. Um, anyways, that uh, production, when it did happen, um, uh, our great revelation was that it's a, a running time of about two hours and 20 minutes. And... Uh, People told us repeatedly, there is no way that you're going to get an audience in Beirut to sit tight for two hours and 20 minutes and watch anything. I don't care if John Lennon comes back from the dead. They're not, you know, everybody's going to start texting, everybody's going to leave after about an hour and start getting antsy. And uh, in fact, we uh, rented Babel Theater, which is next to AUH, and uh, three nights um, it was full, and maybe three or four people left at some point. Other than that, people really riveted. And the story is, uh, uh, with good reason, very much associated with um, um, a kind of empowerment and transformation, and therefore it converged very much with the zeitgeist of the moment, i.e. the Arab Spring. This idea of transformation, whether it was a sexual coming out, whether it was female empowerment, whether it was a, a cleric able to sort of get in touch with this kind of human side of uh, himself. Um, 
That project then, we immediately just went to the next one, was one that uh, Sahar um, uh, uh, came up with, uh, which was inspired by Griselda Gambaro, who's an Argentine, who did a uh, play called, it's called Museum for Foreigners. And, information for Yeah, foreigners. Information for Foreigners. And, um, uh, which takes place in a museum. Which takes place in a museum. And it's basically exp explaining the Guerra Sucia, the dirty war in Argentina, to foreigners. And um, her idea, Sahar's idea, was um, how would you transform this in the Arab world, and um, especially about the Lebanese Civil War. And we went through a number of iterations, uh, thinking about doing it at the National Museum, which is you know, the Matop, the major museum, doing it at the a AUB Museum. Um, then sort of simultaneously what took place is Sahar found this very interesting neighborhood right in the center of uh, Beirut called uh, Handak al Um It's a, a largely Shia neighborhood and it was a, sort of a ground zero during the Lebanese Civil War. And uh, I had an idea, well, it could be an architectural tour. Um, because it's something you almost never see, the idea that the Lebanese would go on foot on a tour is just, you know, very hard to believe. It's like not something you see. You see foreigners do that, but um, so the idea then became that the, it's an architectural tour in which you talk about everything but the war. And it's staring you in the face at every moment, you know, uh, uh, bullet riddled buildings on facades. There's evidence, physical evidence of the war everywhere you go, and yet the uh, tour guide is going, well, this building was influenced by Gaudi. You know, Sonny was like one of yeah. the tour guides, who's yeah. our moderator here. And basically, I wrote a script, and he and Rafi Ferrali improvised from the script. Um, and it was fascinating to see some people actually thought it was a real tour. You know, they were like taking <laughs> pictures. There were some people who got confused or whatever. Um, uh, and and uh, Sahar then um, uh, found uh, uh, scenes that were um, uh, inserted, uh, whether it was an Armenian woman who's like fighting over the name of the street, or you're in an old building and you're coming on snipers who are playing a game of cards or whatever. And in the meantime, uh, Sonny and uh, Rafi, the tour guys, are going, look at the frescoes here that are like, whatever is going on, it's all about, you know, oh, the balustrade here is really beautiful or whatever. And um, uh, so it was a very different experience. This was, we developed what we kind of call an aesthetics of necessity, which is to say that, again, we have no infrastructure, really, at AB. We have no theater, we have no costume shop, we have no lighting, we have, so we have to reinvent the wheel every time, and it can make you very creative. I mean, it'll drive you crazy after a while, but um, at least at the beginning, that's uh, what it did. Um, Drove us crazy, I mean. Um, and uh, the next project we did was uh, uh, another one news play, um, also in English, that uh, Nanda and I uh, had uh, uh, translated called Ale Tisab, uh, The Rape. It's a, a play that's um, uh, inspired, or even more than an inspired by Spanish uh, play um, uh, called The Double Life of Dr. Valmy. Uh, that play is about, about the use of torture during, as a means of, uh, I'm sorry, rape as a means of uh, interrogation, a torture technique during the Franco era. And so one is transposed this to the West Bank. And uh, it, you know, it translates in a way that's uh, sort of frightening uh, how well it uh, translates. So that was the second uh, project that we did. And here again, we had a question about whether or not Beirut audiences would go for such a thing. I mean, it's a very tough play, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, uh, we worked with different people. We worked with some of the same people. Um, that was actually staged at LAU. So um, what we began to do then through these projects is that we then began uh, a whole kind of uh, of uh, relationship uh, internationally. We were invited to Belgium. As I said, we had this relationship with the theater in Chicago. Uh, Frank, who just walked in, who curates uh, events and is the director at uh, uh, the Siegel Center at CUNY here in New York. Um, Saha was 
appeared uh, in a play in London and developed a relationship with uh, them, the Faction Theater. We went on to um, work with them on um, uh, our production of Lear, which uh, we did in 2016 for the 150th anniversary of AV. And then our most recent production, which uh, uh, Sahar can perhaps talk about more, is another site-specific piece in the village in uh, Hamana, which uh, is blood wedding uh, in Lebanese vernacular um, in the Lebanese village of Hamana. Uh, with an art uh, uh, artist house that's there, and that was the opening event for a conference on Latin America, Al Andalus, and the Arab world. So we had scholars coming from all over the world, and a number of them went up to the village. The first event in the conference was this Spanish play done in Arabic in a Lebanese village, and that's what the conference was about. Was about transmission of culture across. Uh, um, different um, uh, regions, so to speak. So those are, you know, that's a thumbnail sketch of some of the things that we've done um, that will give you some sense in the last five years. Thank you, Robert. In the last 30 seconds, from your experience, um, is teaching and doing theater in the Arab world essentially the same thing as doing it in the U.S. and other places you've been involved in, Latin America? Or is there is it all very culture specific? Uh, Sahar and I were actually talking about it last night. I think uh, the key component is vitality. It does matter, um, and it comes out in the productions. It really matters, uh, and it's one thing to say that blood wedding can be seen as an allegory of the Spanish Civil War. Frequently, it is seen. If you set that play in 1970, whatever, in the village in Lebanon. Uh, and when it ends and, you know, the, the play ends, you go, oh, this is the harbinger of something really terrible, this family feud. And I think people sense that. They sense it unconsciously. Or, uh, you know, the rape, you know, the fact that so many people have experienced uh, directly or indirectly um, with Palestinians. Or these are absolutely vital sorts of questions. And I think that... With the exception of, of uh, the play that I was talking about, that Laura, um, you know, uh, about Matthew Shepard, the Laramie Project, that vitality, the sense that this absolutely matters, you're having this essential conversation. I think it shows up in the end product, and that's radically different. You see it somewhat in Latin America because the stakes are so high. So in that sense, it's different, and I think the students and the artists respond in that way. Thank you, Robert. We'll go to Sahad to give us her sure. views and comments, and again, looking at sort of transnational, multicultural, um, and over time. When you're looking, you're, you're dealing with plays from the 20s and 30s and 40s, you've done Shakespeare. Some device, so, yeah. you know, it goes way back in time, as well as transcending cultures. So, give us your thoughts on that. Thank you, Rami, and thanks, Robert. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, everyone in the room. It's uh, really an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting us. Um, to, to take to continue from where Robert actually uh, stopped, this model that we created, Robert and I, in 2013, maybe we we it was in a way improvised to make the play happen, Rituals of Science and Transformation, which was a huge play, as Robert explained. Uh, to to be able to to make that play, we created the model of bringing in professionals to work with us side by side with the students. And it worked beautifully for that first production. Uh, so then we started using, you know, developing that model and using it again. And one of the things that we're, uh, you know, so happy that we could achieve at AUB with the theater initiative is that it really took theater out of the campus borders. So we're we're doing theater supported by. AUB as an institution, but we're really taking it outside, and outside not only to the Lebanese theatrical scene, but outside really to the world. So, for instance, just to mention a few collaborators, the project that Robert mentioned, the Watch Your Step, which we called Watch Your Step uh, Beirut Heritage Walking Tour. That project, we collaborated with the International Center for Transitional Ju uh, uh, Justice in Beirut that gave us material that was partly fictional, partly based in uh, real stories, and we wanted to, uh, you know, uh, present a personal, uh, you know, kind of experiences that, about the war, not the political, uh, you know, aspects about the war. So we wanted to listen to the to the stories of the people who lived the war. So 
the 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 narrative that Robert wrote was actually the fictional part of the story, which is the architectural tour. But then it was this narrative was interrupted by scenes happening in different areas in in the different buildings and rooms and on the street that are actually based on uh, on real stories. I see Lean in the auditorium who started as a volunteer in Rituals of Sign and Transformation. She played and then she played a role in. Uh, uh, watch your step, uh, which was actually based on uh, on the story of a woman that uh, you know was you know saving the bread for the family because they were you know they were living in times when uh, you know met food material were scarce. Um, so that was one of the and we collaborated with them. Um, uh, so so what what I would like to talk about actually is. Um, the next projects that we're doing at the initiative, and uh, one of them would involve collaborating with Tectonic Theatre Project through inviting Glory to Beirut. Um, the kind of work, before I jump into that, I just want to say, like, we've been interested in different kinds of work. So we've done text-based theatre from the Arab world, we've done Shakespeare, we've done Lorca recently, the last production was Blood Wedding, and I saw also actress here, May and Joad, hello, and other people. I can't recognize the faces. Um, Pascal, of course, was in Blood Wedding. And we, sometimes we present it in a, in a proscenium, but sometimes you know, we choose to also explore with different dramaturgical approaches, like with Blood Wedding, for instance, presenting the play as a site-specific production, you know, being faithful to the text of the play and the story, extremely faithful, but then moving that play that was written for a proscenium and <coughs> placing it in a village where the village, the entire village, or like part of the village, but really many locations such as houses of villagers, the church and old cinema became the actual uh, stage for us. So it's again fixing, you know, mixing uh, real the real with the fictional, but every time in a in a different approach. Uh, the next project in line, uh, Robert is working on a documentary play that he can talk about in a second in collaboration with Rami. And I'm also developing a play that I've started in 2017 that I called No Demand, No Supply, which is a play about uh, the sex trafficking scandal that was, you know, that was uncovered in Lebanon in 2016, April of 2016. There was a huge scandal in Lebanon. Uh, the police uh, saved 75 Syrian women from the biggest sex trafficking network in the country. And the story gained huge media at attention. Uh, women were telling the stories of torture that they experienced at the, the nightclubs or the brothels, Shea Maurice and Silver. Um, so it, it, you know, because we're both very much uh, into political and social theater, and really we work in connection with the society. So we 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 feed that society back through our theater, but we're also, you know, affected by what's happening around us. So this was um, my motivation at first was like, I want to understand it, like why did it affect me so much? So. I got the opportunity in 2017 to put on a play, like at least a work in progress, supported by the Center of Arts and Humanities at AUB. Um, and really what I started off doing is that I wanted to tell the stories of these women. That was my first motivation. As I was researching uh, and in collaboration with CAFA NGO, again, uh, you know, in Lebanon, uh, an NGO that works uh, to, the, to empower women, uh, they tackle issues of domestic violence, migrant workers, and prostitution, and several meetings with Ghada Jafur, the expert on trafficking and uh, prostitution, I came to, to the realization that one element in that, in that uh, you know, story was missing, and that is the element of the sex buyer. So there's all these women, the 75 women, you know, being abused on daily basis. The police reports mentions that the, the traffic the, the trafficking network were making around one million dollar a month, huge figures. And then not one mention about the buyers who are actually Lebanese men, you would assume. Rightly. Uh, correctly. So this became the new aspect that I wanted to shed light on. And, um, you know, the play is 
you know, as I said, we're still developing that play, uh, working on you know collecting different material. But the material that I used for that, at least the, fir the four performances that uh, you know made the life of the play, I did one performance at AUB, LAU, the Lebanese American University uh, Center of um, Women's Research. They invited me to put on a play, and then CAFA, the NGO I worked with sponsored a performance at Medina. So we started university <coughs> campus, took it outside to Al Medina Theater, which is in the city. And then I was invited to put it in uh, between the seas in Athens. So the first four performances, the kind of material we used for that play was basically uh, the stories collected by investigative reporters from the women, uh, sto the police reports, studies that CAFA NGO did on prostitution and mishmashed everything together. I used the Adikid Life uh, recorded delivery technique. Um, this leads me to, to say that um, my probably my initial inspiration in documentary theater, like what you step was really a tiny step in that uh, you know direction. Um, and then Ana Amel, Ana Amel, a project I did at AUB uh, about the experience of janitors and the workers at AUB, which was all based on interviews. We collected, the students and I collected 72 interviews with janitors, with faculty members, community members, to, to really talk about the experience of um, you know, these workers that we see on daily basis, but we really don't see. Mm. So um, that was another uh, experience. And then the no demand, no supply. But it really goes back my inspiration to um, you know, learning about the Laramie project that Tectonic Theatre Project did. And you know, I was a little late to learning about the project. I only uh, read it in 2000. 10, 9 or 10 when I was studying in the United States and I like I was blown away by the experience and the story and the approach um, and then last year I was here in New York and um, I, I never I've, I've been a fan of the Tectonic Field project but I've never really experienced their work live at least so I knew that they were opening Uncommon Sense, and I decided to postpone my travel one day to catch the first preview. Mm -hmm. And that's when I met Zena, uh, Zena, I think uh, her name is, and she put me in touch with Lori. So now what is going to happen is that we're uh, the theater initiative, and also in, in collaboration with the um, Casas, uh, you know, that Robert, Robert is leading this year, we're inviting Lori to Beirut. Uh, in February to develop no demand, no supply, you know, and use some of the te techniques that Tectonic use, um, hopefully. And then the next presentation of the play will be in New York in May, uh, also at Between the Seas Festival. So this is something that's happening now. I don't know how much time I still have, yeah, but yes, okay. okay, great. So before I, I turn it over to Lori, um, I would also like to highlight another project that we're uh, launching soon, and that is the Mediterranean, what we're calling the um, Director's Lab Mediterranean, which is, which, is, uh, which is going to be a sister lab to the Lincoln Center Director's Lab, the famous Lincoln Center Director's Lab. And uh, last year, the Theatre Initiative invited a group of alumni of the, of the lab to Beirut to, for a retreat. So we had directors participating from um, Greece, from Italy, from Spain, uh, from Lebanon, from Jordan, uh, and Catania, the founder and, of the Lincoln uh, Center Lab and the dramaturg at the Lincoln Center was also there. And the group met for like three long intensive days where we actually laid the foundation of what's going to be the med lab. So the launching year of that med lab is going to happen in Beirut, in Lebanon, uh, at EUB in uh, July 2019. And the idea is that it's going to rotate around the Mediterranean city. Mm -hmm. So I think these, th this also gives an example of the kind of work that we're interested in. And, why it's political and social, like this project, um, the Med Lab, what, what we're hoping it will do is that, uh, you know, challenge some of the terminologies that we use as, you know, you know, we think of the region as Middle East or Europe, uh, Southern Europe or North Africa or, but it's really, uh, you know, there's more basis for common um, grounds and cultural exchange that can happen if we just open up a little bit and 
um, you know, use maybe different words to begin with. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to stop here. Since I don't well, know. let me, you have a, two minutes left. Let right. me ask you yeah. two quick questions, mm -hmm. and then we'll get into more of the discussion. Are you concerned at all that you're dealing with some really sensitive issues, mm -hmm. which uh, this is what art and theater does, of course. Are you concerned that uh, the space to do this in the Arab world is slowly diminishing? There's very few places in the Arab world where you can deal with topics like this in public. And, and is theater a particularly appropriate um, uh, form of art to use to, uh, to address these issues and to try to reach a public audience? What, isn't cinema maybe better or radio where you can reach millions of people? What, what makes theater so appropriate for this kind of activism? I think you're, I'm very biased, so I'm going to say it is the most appropriate medium. I think, especially in Lebanon, I mean, think about it, we still have censorship on theater, which tells you, like, it, it, this idea of censorship and how the government is really concerned about what's going presented on stage, the live, I think, aspect of theater is very powerful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if it wasn't that powerful, why would they try to censor it, you know. So for instance, for us, it has been a challenge at many instances, you know, to work, because you have to work with the censorship office. You're presenting uh, these plays. When we did rituals, we had to change the name of the mufti. It was, there's no way you could put a mufti on stage, you know, proposing, expressing his love to a prostitute, like just, that, just to simplify. Um, same thing when we did the story on what you step, uh, uh, the, the war, you know, it, it's a story about the Lebanese civil war, and the Lebanese civil war is still um, a taboo topic. You're not, you don't talk about it. That's why we took the personal and, you know, approach to the to uncovering some of the experiences that people live. It is, I, I think, for us, honestly, it has not been, a, a, or maybe I should speak about myself, it hasn't been a major issue because it pushes you to finding ways to telling these stories, you know, mm -hmm. which, which is not to say, like, it's okay, it's, I'm totally against, you know, any kind of censorship on, on the arts and on theatre, but it's, I'm not stopping, I, I won't stop doing theatre just because we have this, I'm, or I'm not even changing what topics I want to, to, to uncover, you know, like the No Demand, No Supply project, a major aspect of the story is the involvement of the general security and um, with the trafficking network like they've been the women were say like were arrested on several occasions and they would say that we're trafficked we're not here by and like no one would listen to them you know they would the, the network would bribe you know the officers and they would be taken back to that so it, it 10 years that trafficking ring survived you know so and, and that was part of the play. Now I'm saying it, we're live streaming. I don't know, uh, you know. Well, it's, that's what you do in theater, you're alive. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, like, I, I, I have to confess, I didn't submit that text to the censorship, so high censorship. But, um, maybe next time when we work with Lori, we'll do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think theater is is so powerful and I think just the act of doing theatre can be by and it in itself very political, especially when you're living in a region like ours, you know. There's so many challenges you have to but if you I mean I'm I, personally as an artist, this is what I want to do. Like these are the kind of issues I want to address. So I'm just not gonna you know Thank you. Mm -hmm. While well, talking of a politicized culture, here we are in New York, in the <laughs> United States, uh, in the era of Trump, and uh, these are wild days. Um, and um, the stuff you hear on in the media every day is quite extraordinary. Um, um, so, Laurie, Laurie Latham, you've been involved in, I don't know what you call it, progressive theater or activist theater, political theater. and. Uh, uh, called tectonic theater, uh, so tectonic meaning like tectonic plates that you're shaking the ground beneath people, I suppose. You can explain to us, and and from your perspective, from what you've heard uh, about theater in the Middle East and what we're trying to do at AUB, and from your knowledge of the cross-cultural uh, legacy of theater globally, um, what would you say is going on today in your world? Why are you doing what you do? And, and what do you hope to do? And how can you maybe do it better if you link up as you're doing with AUB? Right. 
great questions, and thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I, I want to sort of, uh, by way of, of answering your question, I want to jump on the question you asked Sahar, and you know, what, how do we uh, address sensitive topics as artists? Um, uh, Tectonic Theatre Project has as its mission um, to uh, uh, what can theatre do that no other medium can do. And it does have a power all its own. Um, it's not a substitute for cinema or radio or anything like that. It's a completely different thing. Um, it's uh, community building. There's something incredibly magic about uh, people being in the live space. Um, but it also, uh, um, it is a beautiful way of asking the most sensitive uh, questions. Um, and I, I have very fresh in my mind, last night um, we had a benefit for the 20th anniversary of the Laramie <coughs> Project. It was a benefit for Tectonic Theater Project and the Matthew Shepard Foundation. Um, and it was the original cast and creators of the Laramie Project. Uh, along with some uh, celebrity uh, guest artists. And can, can you explain to our I, audience what's the Larry Project? I'm about to go right into that. <laughs> so, uh, 20 years ago, almost to the day, um, a young gay uh, student at the um, University of Wyoming in Laramie was um, picked up in a bar by a couple of guys. He was taken uh, out to some remote location, beaten and tied to a fence and left to die. Um, this galvanized, uh, it became such a, a, a huge flashpoint for the, the culture at the time. Um, it was, uh, you know, one of those tipping points, as we're having now with, you know, Me Too, you could say, um, that it was just a, 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 um, an incident that created such huge media attention. Um, Moises Kaufman, the artistic director of uh, Tectonic Theatre Project, had just come off a very successful run of a play called Gross Indecency, The Three Trials of Oscar Wilde, you know, Little Money in the Bank. That was the first big production of Tectonic um, that Robert knows quite well, I believe. Um, and uh, he, he said to his company, we need to go to Laramie and we're gonna go talk to the people of that town. And um, this is another thing that I think theater does uh, in a way that no other uh, medium can do. It, it brings people together. So these. This group of artists from New York had the courage and the boldness to say, we're going to go to Laramie, Wyoming. We don't know anybody there. And we're going to talk to everybody in that town. We're going to, we're going to find out what we can about this, these people. Not necessarily the murder of Matthew Shepard, but the people of the town, how it affected the town, how something like this could happen. They went, they visited Laramie several times. They came back to New York with something like, 400 hours of interview material. They then went into the rehearsal process, and over the course of, of a couple of years, they created this play called The Laramie Project. The shock of The Laramie Project is that it's still relevant. This was 20 years ago. Um, and we the, last night, um, this was a, the discussion that we were having all day and, and pretty much all night last night. Was, you know, the, the, the good news and the bad news is that it's still relevant. You know, why is this play still important? It continues to be one of the most produced plays uh, in the United States. It's been translated into something like 17 languages. Um, and uh, it still speaks to people. I get calls all the time from high school teachers in Texas, Arkansas, Nebraska, doing the play and having pushback from their school boards, their church communities, their, their parent bodies. Uh, people don't want us to do this play. Uh, we went out the day after Trump was elected. We got on a plane and went to Blue Hill, Nebraska, which is not that far from Laramie in American terms. Big distances, <laughs> right? Um, uh, and we visited with a, a cast of students doing the Laramie Project, and the minute we walked in the room, they all pretty much, many of them burst into tears. Um, their parents were boycotting the production. The pastors of their churches had told the school uh, that they don't support it. They, they told the parents not to go. Um, and so we went there as a show of support and because we were feeling rather powerless in the wake of the election. Um, so th these kinds of things are still happening. Um, you, you know, I think that, that the, I, I could speak honestly uh, for the members of the company uh, when I say that I don't think it was anticipated that that play would turn into something as important as it is 
artistically, but also something that would have this kind of lasting 20 years later relevance. So I think um, that uh, theater is a way to address um, sensitive topics, difficult uh, um, issues in our civil discourse. I think it's a way to bring people together. Um, and so, um, the, I, you know, this is just one example. But um, we, uh, the, the other thing that's remarkable about the Laramie Project and the other work that Tectonic does is that it often, with Laramie Project in particular, it's all based on, it's not based on, it's every single word of dialogue in that play is, is from an interview or a piece of, of text, a transcript from the trial. Um, the other thing I just have to say, because it was so remarkable, last night, Dennis Shepard, Matthew Shepard's father, um, delivered on stage the speech that he delivered, um, allowing the uh, killer uh, not to be given the death penalty, because they left it up to him. Um, and he delivered a speech to uh, the murderer of his son in the court, and he was on stage last night delivering it, and we were just all, I mean, I'm, I'm, tearing up just thinking about it. But anyway, so it, uh, it was a remarkable evening and it's very fresh in my mind. So, uh, but um, th the trick is, you know, how do you create good theater from something like that, from interview material? Um, the, the other remarkable thing about what Tectonic did uh, over the course of all these years in productions is that they developed, Moises and the company developed a new method of creating theater. So this does not involve a playwright going into a room for 10 years and coming out with a play that she has written and then handing it over to a director and then the director hiring actors. That, that's the typical way that theater is made. There's nothing wrong with that method. It's beautiful. It works. It's created many, many wonderful pieces of, of theater. But this is, is where um, the director, the, the writers, uh, the actors, the designers, if possible, all go into a rehearsal room together with the interview material or just an idea, what we call a hunch. And um, they create moments. So the method is called moment work. And you go and you create moments using all the elements of the theater on an equal footing. So lighting is not considered less important than text. Performance is not considered less important than directing. Um, and you create these moments, you string them together, and you begin to create a narrative that way. And um, so while Tectonic was creating the Laramie Project, <coughs> they were also developing and codifying this method. And that's uh, what I'm in charge of, um, uh, the Moment Work Institute. So we have many, many teachers. Um, and increasingly the world over. So getting back to your question about global, um, it, you know, the importance of global partnerships, it's very important to me personally. Um, I think uh, the United States is a place where people are very much more insular than other parts of the world for many reasons. Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, Americans don't tend to speak other languages, which I think is a shame. Um, so I, you know, personally for me, I think, and I'm especially now with, with exactly what you said, this, this insane climate that we're in, um, I think that the, the importance of <clears throat> dialoguing across cultures is, is just uh, of the utmost importance. And especially in this way, when you're creating a piece of, of art together, when you're learning from each other, I think that there's nothing more powerful than that. So. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm really happy to be um, able to, to you know, do what I can to uh, help with, with your piece and, and teach a workshop in, in this method, which I think is, is very often a beautiful way if you're struggling with how to tell a story. How do I tell this story? I mean, these stories are, are really, really big. Um, there, you know, we feel the weight of, uh, so I'm sure you do, the weight of you know, the importance of telling it uh, correctly. There's a line in the Laramie Project where yeah. a Catholic priest says, listen, I'll talk to you, but you have to get it right. Mm -hmm. Don't get our story wrong. Get it right. Say it right. And there is this, this incredible importance mm -hmm. when you're going in and interviewing people and telling their story, you do feel the weight of getting it right. But you can't be, um, 
you know, there's uh, Moises is very against the, the word, uh, the term verbatim theater, because the minute you edit something out, it's no longer verbatim and you're making a choice. You're making a, an artistic choice um, of what to keep in and, and, and what to, how to sequence things. It's, it's all very, very subjective from an artistic standpoint. So, um, so given that, you want to tell a good story, you want to keep the audience's attention, and yet you have this duty to the people that you're interviewing to get the story right. So it's, it's a balance, um, and moment work is a, is a particularly beautiful way, I believe, of, of um, loosening up those kinds of reins and allowing you to uh, really explore uh, a narrative in, in a really different way that's very freeing. Um, and it's, 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 it's liberating because we often, as writers, stare down the blank page, and which can be terrifying and, and paralyzing, <laughs> um, as we all know. Um, so it's a way of getting in a room with other people and, and seeing what the story has, has to tell us, in a way. So, uh, you have another two, three minutes. Uh, so what you seem to be doing with this moment work is to do what writers are doing with creative nonfiction, or narrative writing, which is taking the reality of the world researching it, capturing it, and presenting it to the reader in, in long form, uh, written, uh, written form. You're taking the reality from people's interviews, selecting from them, putting them together accurately, getting it right, and presenting it to the, uh, to the audience. This is a radical change in how theater historically has been done, isn't it? Uh, in the sense that there is not one writer, yes, I right. think it is a, a, quite a change. I do have to say that Tectonic does not only do interview-based theater. There, there are plays that are uh, created whole cloth from from fiction as well. So um, I, I just want to make th that clear. But um, but we are most known for the Laramie Project and other um, uh, nonfiction uh, texts. So, um, but yes, the, the, it is a radical. Um, it is a, a, a very different way of working, um, and um, that's why we have created an institute where we, we want people to be able to, to make use of it and, 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 and learn how to do it. Um, it does have rigor to it. it. There's a definite method. We just came out with a book. Uh, um, Random House published uh, our book in April. It's called Moment Work, Tectonic Theater projects process of, of creating theater and um, it takes you through uh, the entire process from day one in a workshop all the way through the, the creation of, of a piece and um, so it is it's, it's highly rigorous as well as being exploratory and, and playful but yes it is a very different way of creating theater it does differ quite quite in, in major ways from the traditional model and you still have a minute uh, yep. so I can ask you so what is, why do you do this as, uh, as, as a theater person or dramatist, whatever is the right terminology? I'm a writer, so it's a for me. But are you simply trying to show the audience or show the public the elements of their life that is worth them appreciating? Are you trying mm -hmm. to shock people? Are you trying to motivate people? Um, mm -hmm. your, your kind of work is uh, political often. It mm -hmm. uh, has to do with the with the public sphere, you're not mm -hmm. necessarily just talking about, you know, in the old right. days, drama was about love and mm -hmm. filial and gratitude and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so why do you do this? What's the purpose? So I think I'm going to refer back to Laramie Project again. Um, the, the beauty in that work for me is that every single person represented on that stage is a human being with a beating heart and uh, wants and desires and... Um, we as an audience sit there and, and, and feel all of them. And that is such a, there is no other medium I don't think that can do that in that way. There are, I, I can't remember the number of characters in that play, but it's many characters. It's like, it's more than 35 characters, a lot of characters. How many, uh, around 200 interviews you've done? Um, well, they, it's hours of interviews. I don't know how many actual interviews, but it, it's a lot of people. It's police it's people who are, are homophobic. It's it's the all the members of that community and every viewpoint about what happened to that boy, why it happened, whether or not the gay lifestyle is is you know to be celebrated or condemned. You know, um, all of those people spoke uh, in a way that is so um, empathetic, and so 
uh, there's a there's a, a line that got said last night. Um, the opposite of hate is empathy, um, and I, I I believe that very strongly. And so I feel like if we're not trying to shock people. I think we're trying to um, get to the humanity of every single living person, and that is the way that we can come to some kind of understanding. So it's not it's not rhetoric. It's it's let's understand each other as as humans, and let's tell each other stories. Thank you. We will shift to Beirut now. Thank you, and Beirut, for being so uh, patient. Um, Sani Abdelbahi is a faculty member at Lebanese American University and a very active uh, uh, theater person and uh, acting and other things, and with a rather international, global uh, background as well. So, Sani, if you could give us uh, some comments on what you've heard and uh, perhaps adding to it from your own experiences. Yeah, um, I would I would like to I would like to talk about two productions that um, that we actually just uh, briefly, very briefly, three productions that I worked with uh, with Sahar and Robert on, um, which because uh, it was said uh, previously about how this this dialogue between cultures and and taking different uh, uh, having a different having maybe looking at the same story from a different perspective. Uh, which is very insightful for for like for me uh, as an actor. Um, we did this one uh, production of August of Sage County, and it was uh, it was very interesting. Uh, Sahar and uh, and uh, another collaborator, uh, Rafi Ghali, they had to to translate the play, uh, and it was very interesting that. Uh, that were uh, the stories of the characters in that day uh, were not changed so much, uh, and you're talking you're talking about two completely different cultures that have so much uh, in common. I don't know how it was like a, uh, it was the, the, the it's based in um, uh, Sahar. Correct me if I'm if I'm if I'm wrong, but it's based in uh, which which no, no, no. Oklahoma, yes, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we had that uh, project, which was uh, which was interesting to, to bridge these cultures, and also for me as an actor, speaking from a, ca a character's perspective, uh, that was also very interesting. The character of L uh, Little Charles, um, and finding that how such a character would walk among us in, in our culture here, um, and uh, there, there was uh, one of the most uh, one of the most challenging, I think, roles that that I uh, that I had to play was, of course, a play that uh, uh, that relates to our society to a very very sensitive, controversial topic, the play of uh, the race, Abdullah one Muslim, the race, um, because it deals with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is a sensitive issue all around the world, uh, and even more so uh, here in, in Lebanon. In this region, at least, and uh, it was very interesting um, to uh, to play a character from uh, to play a, basically the character was uh, Yitzhak, who is he, who is uh, who works for the Shin Bet uh, internal uh, Israeli intelligence, and uh, it was very interesting and challenging to play this role because uh, I had to try to. Uh, justify uh, this character's actions, try to understand his perspective, and for me that that was the most challenging uh, bit. Um, yeah, so uh, it was uh, it, it was it took uh, many weeks of uh, of, uh, of research and trying to really embody the character, but the, but uh, the most difficult aspect of it was the justification that the character. Uh, has for uh, for his actions working as an intelligence officer, no matter which side he's uh, he's working for, uh, but with the methods that he uses. So uh, so that's what that was insightful. But what 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 was very important was really to uh, um, to, to allow from what I, from what I experienced was to really talk about this topic. Uh, out loud, you know, not not to not to keep it something that's uh, uh, 
um, hidden under the carpet as we do with most taboo subjects. Um, yeah, so these, these were uh, the two productions that I found uh, very interesting working with uh, Sahar and Robert on, as well as, of course, King Lear. King Lear was another, uh, because, because I've had my, my training as an actor in, in classical training, I worked on Shakespeare and Chekhov and Greek plays, and it was really uh, refreshing to have, um, to have uh, uh, one of Shakespeare's plays uh, translated and uh, and adapted and most more importantly, uh, really for the audience to see how simple it is and how down to earth it, it can be, you know, um, where uh, I think I think I don't know Sahar, but I think that one of the some of the most uh, difficult uh, lines for you to translate were the fool lines, right? You have to ask Nada. She's sitting right there. Ah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I think it was one of the most difficult. Uh, I think you have to be a fool. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you you know I, I think what what I what I found interesting in that play was that it wasn't uh, I I didn't feel it was so much adapted to a Lebanese culture, but it, we found a kind of you know, the, uh, a more universal uh, uh, language. I don't know. I have to go back to it. actually. I touched upon an idea. I mean, a remark or an idea I've been thinking about, you know, from the conversations that we've been having, which is thinking, you know, thinking about what was said from my perspective as a person who worked on theater, not necessarily on performance, but on text and the creation of text that eventually gets performed. That's where my my contribution has been to this whole uh, context. And actually, yes, I mean, with Shakespeare, the language is very literary, it's very high, it's very poetic, and it was sort of um, finding similar re registers in Arabic that would give that same impression. But, you know, to go back to what you were saying and probably, you know, connecting some of the, uh, you know, the, the points which were raised by several of the secrets, I couldn't help but see a certain progression probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's been a certain progression in the work and in the project that, you know, Sahar and Robert and you and, you know, and, you know this, this group has been working on for several years, which is to go from texts that are very well crafted, but that do not speak about a specific incident that is, you know, on the ground. You know, if you think of what Lori was just saying, it is just letting people say their stories. So you put the stories together, but there is a specific person who has lived, you have seen this person, you, you interview them, and then it is a, the text is actually made as you are performing it, as you are creating it. So there is a different dynamic, as probably Lori was, Lori was saying, of how to make the text. But I've seen, you know, from what we've been doing, Robert and I and then Sahar, the texts we worked on initially were texts that were totally the opposite. Actually, they tried to avoid a lot to talk about what is around us directly, but they actually do it through uh, hints, through going back to history. You invest in a certain story that took place 200 years ago. You take, you know, issues that are so unfamiliar, but in a certain way, it is the, um, it is the, the, uh, uh, the dramatist or the, the, the author's uh, technique of bringing that thing, which looks like it is so remote and it is so unfamiliar to your life, just make it very familiar. Now, my question, I do not have anything to consider here, but probably I have a question. Is specifically, I'm, I'm talking about the early texts we worked on, like rituals, uh, 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 like probably a little bit, you know, in King Lear might be one, um, you know, the rape, uh, and, and the other texts that are very, very literary and, and don't look like they are talking about specific, you know, experiences or experiences that you actually live. What would what what is the role of the dramaturg? What is the role of the of the of the actor? How do you actually make it so relevant 
uh, and, and try to present it as being politically uh, uh, relevant to this day and age. And can you explain, probably Robert and Saha can actually explain that. I mean, I see that there has been a progression, direct progression, from very literary text to documentary and, and real life kind of text. Can you, can you just comment about, on this kind of project, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, track that you have taken because it looks like it's consistently going more and more towards, towards that. Well, thank you, Nada. And that opens up our discussion period. And I would just add to what you both said uh, in a way to put it more provocatively. It sounds like theater is moving into the stage equivalent of reality television. If you're basically, yeah. uh, that's dramatizing, of course, but if you're taking real life mm -hmm situation, people's real words, people's real sentiments, and putting them on stage in live performances. So what separates theater from reality TV uh, in the way that you find most useful and therefore you keep doing it? Yeah, it's something that you said, Laurie, about the verbatim documentary terms that we use. And I, I just want to quote uh, Carol Martin, who said, um, you know, that it's one of the most interesting definitions about documentary theater that I've read, is that documentary theater is not, is, is not equivalent to me. I'm, I'm, of course, paraphrasing. It's not equivalent to uh, media, uh, per se. It's maybe more superior to media because it's more subjective, mm -hmm. not because it's objective. Mm -hmm. And I find that very interesting, you know, you're not really, what I did with the no demand, uh, no supply piece, I think, or what I wanted to do, and I think with the work that we're going to develop together, I'll be able to do that more, is to really influence the mainstream media rather than the opposite, because, you know, they've been focused on the story from one perspective. And one of the successes, I think, of the show in Beirut, uh, after the show at Al Medina, uh, there was a TV presenter sitting in the auditorium. Uh, she's she's uh, she's a um, uh, she's a reporter for a program called Al Nashr by, at New TV, which is one of the local TV channels that is most watched in Lebanon. And that program in particular, because it's like a tabloid kind of show, and she ended up, uh, you know, dedicating a 20-minute segment on her show to talk about the demand aspect in prostitution and sex trafficking. And she actually invited us. I wasn't in Lebanon to attend, but my uh, collaborator, Ghada Jabur, was there. And the first question she addressed to Ghada was, why did I have to wait to watch the play to actually think about that mm -hmm. aspect? Mm -hmm. You know, So this is the power of theater. That's what th how theater can influence not only society, but media, which in turn influence society. So not many people watch the show in Lebanon. But you can see the numbers of people who watch the episode on YouTube, not only live. Like thousands of people watch that. So at least, you know, it takes me to another uh, beautiful, uh, you know, uh, quote on theater that I've ever read by Barba, whom I met this summer at Odin Theater, in, in an essay called The Essence of Theater. He said, we must open the spectator's eyes with the same gentleness that we close um, the, the, the eyes of those a loved one who just died. Mm. And this falls exactly in what you said about, you know, you're not after shocking people. And that's what I was after in No Demand. And in reflection, that's where I think I went wrong. And that's what where I'd like, you know, to develop with you is that how do you get your message across without really attacking the audiences, without mm -hmm. blocking them, without putting them off? Um, so it's, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's just two things that, you know, uh, overlap with what you said and the kind of work that we're doing. Yeah. Any quick comments yeah, before well, we go in, back in, to Yeah, well, in answer to what uh, uh, Nata said and, and what Lori said, uh, two things I would say. First of all, uh, the, the fact that people are uh, uh, multilingual and multicultural and um, Lebanon to such a great extent, I think, blinds them to the fact uh, of how difficult translation is. And we have come up against this over and over again because, first of all, these productions, we, everybody just sort of shifts here, but the first productions that we're talking about were written in Fusa, 
by uh, Sadala Wanus and translated into English, and then they were done uh, in Lebanon in English. Then we ended up doing readings or whatever. Then uh, some of these productions, uh, like Lear, um, for example, um, there is a standard Arabic translation by Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, but it's in Fusha, right? So um, one of the insights that uh, Nada had, that Sahar had, that we had through a process, and these are the kind of moments that come out of a particular cultural situation, is the recognition that if you're speaking in the vernacular, Shakespeare in the vernacular, you're going to experience it in a completely different way, and it will be a kind of family story, which is what we talked about. Uh, a medium who's sitting in the audience, who's my spouse from Brazil, is uh, uh, of Lebanese background, and in her village, in the town that she's from, in Lebanon, uh, I'm sorry, in Brazil, is something that happens in Lebanon with great regularity. The patriarch begins to wane or die, and the family starts fighting, right? And this is the story of Lear, and you're fighting over property. It's, in that sense, it's a story, and I think this answers, uh, you know, not this question about, well, where's the political component? It speaks very much to a situation, and in fact, one of the um, uh, uh, major sources at the beginning, uh, in terms of dramaturgy for the play, was um, uh, uh, Usama Maktoussi's work on confessionalism in the 1860 war in the Shuf. Now, we went through many layers, and the residue of that that was left at the end, you know, is something that we would find at particular moments. It wasn't like we tried to program it, but it very much spoke. The same thing with the blood wedding. Blood wedding very much became an allegory of a family feud, as it were, between two families becoming a, the Civil War. Um, the other thing I would say is, in response to, I have enormous admiration for Moises, and I thought, I recall this quote um, when I interviewed him in 1996 or seven when Gross and Decency opened, and he said that then to me, and I thought this was one of the most extraordinary insights, is what can theater do that other media cannot do? And I think that's an amazing starting point. Having said that, I would say that, you know, versions of this have been going on from the first excellent play. The Persians is a documentary play about the Persian War, Thucydides and Herodotus, when they did history, they did it much like Hakawati's storytellers, who are telling the stories of history. Um, Schiller uh, obviously had his, uh, wrote historical plays. Shakespeare wrote historical plays. Danton uh, samples entire speeches by Saint-Simon and, and uh, Robespierre uh, in Danton's uh, Death of Buchner. So, in other words, there's a very long tradition of uh, this, and what's interesting is when you see this in a new setting, in the Levant, in the Arab world, in Lebanon, I think it's it turns into something else. And I think this is something Sahar's exploring with uh, No Demand, and that we have talked about with the Shadid story, is that you cannot, you know, uh, uh, just take another vessel that's been used, you have to create it new. Heiner Kippart and uh, Peter Weiss wanted to force the uh, German public to look at what had happened during the Second World War, and it became a mechanism through their documentary style plays on the Frankfurt uh, war crime trials, for example, uh, or uh, Robert Oppenheimer, or whatever. So these techniques have been used in different forms. It is There is a long tradition of this theater, um, but it's true that when I saw Gross and Decency, and also um, uh, saw the Laramie Project, I had this feeling, wow, a, a code has been cracked. And you have it about five times in your life. For those of you going, you go, oh, you can do that in the theater. Wow. You go, it's the most obvious thing, and it was sitting there hiding in plain sight. And then when you see someone do it, you kind of, oh, you know, and you it's think, also really hard to do. It is. It looks so easy. You know, it's like you, 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 yeah. you know, you still have to structure a play in a way that works, and that is one of the most difficult things. I mean, anyone who's tried to write a play will tell you it's really not easy. Um, and it's not easy when, you, when you're when you using, you know, non-fiction existing found texts or interview material. It's it's a very tricky thing to do. So yes, cracking the code, I, I agree with that. <laughs> so let me go back to uh, Beirut. If any of the people in Beirut would like to make a comment or ask a question? 
May, it would be wonderful if you would talk about uh, if you would talk about the the blood rape wedding. and talk about blood wedding and Pascal uh, would talk yeah. about blood wedding. We would love it. Come up to the microphone and introduce yourself. Turn it on. And I'm not a good talker and uh, and English, so uh, I'm a bit shy. <laughs> My name is May of the internet, and I've been uh, working with uh, Robert and uh, Sahara. Uh, I've been in three plays already. Uh, the Rape, uh, uh, August Torsuch County, and uh, of course, The Blood Wedding. That is my, personally, my favorite role. <laughs> mm. um, I was acting um, the mother, uh, when the mother that loses. Uh, uh, her husband and her son, and then the second son. Um, what can I say about it? I um, this role made me uh, so so wanting to do more and more theatre. Uh, of course, it's not the first time I, I I feel this way. I've been feeling this since I started working with Sahar and Robert. Uh, but this role was um, so much. Uh, the role of so many mothers in the world. It, it was not. Uh, it, it, it was not. It, um, how can I say it in English? It's universal. It's, uh, it's a mother that is a mother, and uh, that made me really uh, um, be so close to these uh, women that lost their children during the outer war and all the wars in the world. Um, I don't know what to say more. Pascal can talk about it too because she was my uh, my neighbor in the, in the play, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was. Um, please talk because I, I'm too shy to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. So I'm Pascal Smith. I was the neighbor uh, in Blood Wedding. Like. Um, Blood Wedding, like it, it has been a while before Blood Wedding. I saw it theater, but I stopped acting for a while because I needed like to. I got into production and stuff. So when I when I um, uh, apply like uh, for the casting of Blood Wedding and got accepted and working with uh, Sahar and with Robert was like and with all the cast, it was like really a wonderful, wonderful experience. And the setup in uh, Hamana, the village, and how it was like a site specific. All of it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. Unique. It was very unique. And for me in theater, it, in Blood Wedding, I was uh, playing the role of uh, like uh, an old woman, almost, like not too old actually, but older than me, I mean. So it, she was almost like maybe in her 50s, 60s, something like that. So for me, when, when I'm acting in theater, it's, and when if it's an old play of, or if it's something written, like all, like uh, all theater from before until now. Like I'm exploring uh, a, a different perspective of another human being. If it's based on a true story or if it's from someone's imagination, any it it has to exist at some point. So for me, it's it's kind of um, tapping into much more emotion and. Uh, I don't know, like exploring more of life and uh, like being someone else for real and, and doing it in front of people. It's a different, um, I don't know how to say, like vibration because you feel the people and the people feel you. So you, you get to give more and to get more. So the energy, the energy was something else between all the people that were, that were there. It was really something... You need to feel this, um, it's the bond, mm. the real bond between everybody. And the energy was, you know, going from one person to another. And it was amazing, amazing. Yeah. Mm. It was a wonderful experience. Well, if I can just um, add, uh, as a writer myself, I mean, what I find extraordinary in the theater is the live aspect of it, that people are on stage live and, and they do what they do. Of course, the text has already been written and they presented, but this interaction is so powerful uh, that it, uh, it, it, I think it explains a lot of the impact for, uh, for non-specialists, but also for people like yourselves. If I can ask uh, anybody who's involved in this world to comment on, do you do this partly to 
um, to reflect the reality of our world and human emotions and to help people understand uh, our world better. Do you do this partly to point out problems, whether it's things like rape and torture and, and uh, homophobia and killing people and Islamophobia and all of the racism and things that happen? Or do you also try to go one more step and actually help play a role in mobilizing people to do something about these? Or is that not your job? Is it your job simply to capture these emotions and realities, highlight them, and then let society do what it wants? Well, I think it sort of uh, goes to the medium question, which is to say, in theater it happens. This is what really confuses people. We're living in a moment with screens. Uh, we're sort of living in a moment in which representation is once removed. In theater, it's not. If somebody spits on somebody, they spat on them. And, um, you know, uh, Master Harold and the Boys, one of my very favorite plays by uh, Avril Fugard, uh, there is a moment in which uh, um, uh, Hallie, this, uh, who's a character who's based on the playwright, um, uh, tells this hideous racist joke um, to Sam, who's this uh, African man who's raised him, about uh, a black person's uh, ass. And so Sam says, uh, you want to see it? It's like really, oh, and he drops his pants. Well, he dropped his pants. He did it, right? It happened. And that's not what happens on film. That's not what happens in a novel. That's not what happens in new media. In theater, it happened. If two men kissed, they kissed. Oh, you can't do that. And in traditional societies, it has special power because very frequently it is compartmentalized into backstage and on stage. And when you take them and you begin to collapse these different compartments uh, on stage, men don't talk that way to their, uh, you know, or, or uh, women don't talk that way to their husbands. Well, Doll's House, if you do it in Arabic, you're going to get a completely different response than if it's done in English. Oh, you can talk that way in English because it's a play. There's distancing. As soon as you put it in Lebanese vernacular, you're going get, to get something else. So it is activist. There's no way for it not to be activist. The extent is, you know, you know, Brecht sort of notion that it spills off stage and and uh, the extent that you think that might happen, that you are constructing it specifically for that purpose, piscator, um, uh, that's another sort of question. But it is revolutionary because it happened. They were there. You experienced it. You didn't see it or it wasn't shown to you. You lived it. And uh, at least theater that succeeds forces you to live it whether you want to or not. I, um, I, I don't think that <clears throat> artists uh, go in with a with a result in mind. Like, we're, like for example, um, uh, Tectonic Theater Project was invited by Barack Obama to sign the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd um, Hate Crimes Prevention Act, um, along with the Shepherds. Um, uh, so Lowry Project definitely played a role in, in this incredibly important piece of legislation, which has probably saved you know many lives. Um, but that's not the reason anybody went in. I, I you know to to, to Laramie to interview those people. I think what it starts with, and, and you can probably speak to this as well, Summer, is a burning question: How do these things happen? You know, I think that artists go into a project with 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 more of a question mark than anything else. Um, and then, and then the job is, as Robert is saying, is to is to really put yourself in the shoes of the other. And if you can do that, it's it is a revolutionary act. All art is political. Uh, there is no such thing as 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 doing a play without some kind of um, a political uh, statement or or you know the, it's just it's all about that. But but the revolutionary act is really. Um, you know, I'm going to play a murderer, as you know, as, as people have mentioned here. I'm going to play a rapist. I'm going to play uh, somebody who hates homosexuals and and uh, doesn't is not bothered by uh, you know the murder of Matthew Shepard. To to to, to really um, get in the shoes of, of those people, as Shakespearean as as that is, uh, you know, Greek and and you know goes all the way back to the beginning of, of storytelling. Is, is in its essence already an act of, of politics and, and revolution. Absolutely, I mean, I cannot agree more. It's, I think theater is very personal. 
and that's why it's very powerful as well. You know, it starts. Uh, no demand for me started my from my own need to do something because I could not sleep for three days l reading that story. It, you know, and then it developed. And also something that you touched upon by saying the shoot of the other and Pascal said a different perspective. Uh, Sani talked about his experience doing the rape, and I, I I would also like to add that probably that one that was one of the hardest plays I've ever worked on as a director. So the play is about this uh, conflict, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I'm very biased to the Palestinian side of the story. Uh, having lived in Lebanon, been attacked by Israel on several occasions, you know, all through my childhood I've witnessed this life, but I've also had, you know, very, very close to the stories of the Palestinian. But then to be true to my art as a theater maker, I had to be very compassionate to all the characters in the play and to be really lead the actor and coach them to play these characters from the perspective of the characters. So he's a Shem Bet officer, he's doing his job, at least from his perspective. So that was really, really very traumatizing, to say the least, the process itself. But again, it 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 transforms you as an as a theater maker, and I think it it touches the audience. I cannot forget, like for instance, uh, two two things that happened in the auditorium throughout the performances. I think one night a person was shouting at Sunny. Um, <laughs> you know, Sunny was playing his hug, and the, the Israeli officer who was, you know, struggling with his marriage and due to his work and his sex life, and you know, uh, and May was playing the mother. So how do you coach a mother to play a mother? You know, while you think like. The, while all the injustice of the situation is really eating you up, you know, like, how do you do that? And one uh, feedback we got on that play from um, a young, amazing uh, writer and poet in Lebanon, Adham Dimashi, who wrote uh, on an online um, uh, journal or uh, platform, he said, after watching the play, and I'm translating from Arabic from my memory, after watching the play, uh, I'm gonna, it, it, it transformed me in a way that from now on, I'm going to ask for two rights. The right of the Palestinian to live freely and you know, uh, um, safely, and the right of the Jew to live outside the 3,000 year old myth. Mm -hmm. So he could, he could mm -hmm. see the kind of world that Wanus was presenting. But for, you know, for others, it was, very shocking to see that play in Beirut. One night I was standing at the door of the theater and an audience member uh, exiting and talking to another audience member. He didn't know I was the director. He said, yalla, next week we'll see a Zionist play in Beirut. So you've mm. got some people who saw that, oh, we're, you know, we're taking sides here maybe, or not taking sides, which is worse. Or, you know, no, it's, it's beyond that. There's the human aspect of, of things that we, you know, we tend to forget when we're in. So I think that compassion for me as, as a theater maker, I think that's what it gives me. It gives me compassion. Um, and it's beautiful. It's just, you know. And I'd like to reiterate that one thing that's very special about working in Beirut is, for example, May went, oh, I'm a little shy speaking in English. She's French educated, she speaks Arabic, and she was talking about a play that was written by a Spanish playwright, which is translated <laughs> into Lebanese uh, vernacular, you know, and this is simply taken for granted. Nada, who's sitting there, and I have now translated um, uh, seven plays uh, together into English, uh, again, um, uh, and and the resonance of the plays. So once a, 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 a volume is coming out from Brill, of uh, political plays from the Levant, from uh, Syria, from Lebanon, uh, um, and ones uh, coming out with the help of Frank, uh, who allowed us uh, uh, to retranslate uh, some of Wanusa's plays that were already produced in in uh, Beirut, and is coming out from Yale. So, in other words, out of this translation project, there, there are at least two things that happens. One is this extraordinary transmission that allows people, for example, to experience Syria in a way they would never experience, or Palestine in a way they would never experience it. The other is, if 
is sort of the Russian formalist Shlovsky's idea of defamiliarization. If you recontextualize something, you put it in a completely different context, you'll see it differently. And the example I would give is of May, um, who is, as she said, the played the mother of the, the bridegroom. Um, uh, when she comes out of the wedding hall, which is actually in a village, and it's reality made manifest, and uh, the lovers have run off, and she goes, go get them! And everyone does. It was the first time I've read the play, like, you know, six times in Spanish and twice in English. I went, since it's about a, a moment before the Lebanese Civil War, I went, why doesn't she just turn to, you know, her son and go, let's go home. She ran off. Why do they have to, why do you have to go kill these lovers? What, you know, and that how much of what engendered the, the Lebanese Civil War and these sort of conflicts have to do with this idea, well, you simply internalize this idea, we have to go get them and hunt them down and kill them, and out of that <clears throat> comes something else. Well, again, um, by moving it into a new context, and this is something that uh, uh, is really quite extraordinary there, it just doesn't happen in the U.S. It really... This is what you're talking about. Well, you, only in this kind of multilingual environment where things begin to move through languages, you necessarily see it in a way that you wouldn't see it in the, this language or that language. And I'm fortunately the outsider, so I'm looking at it going, wow, this is really amazing. People are just going, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. Right. <laughs> well, it's kind of appropriate that uh, in the land where you know, written languages were born in the Middle East, that we are back now talking again about languages and transmitting across cultures. We have just uh, four or five minutes left. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Sani and then to come back to uh, have your closing comments. Sani, what do you feel the theater initiative at AUB has done? Has it added a new dimension to theater broadly in Lebanon? Has it made any difference to your life uh, personally? Uh, what is the value of this kind of uh, initiative at a university? Um, well, f first of all, has it made a difference? It, made, it, it, has, it has a huge impact on the local theater scene in Lebanon. Uh, it had a huge impact on, on myself because uh, what I enjoy so much about the theater initiative is that it is, uh, the, the academic base of it is vital. You know, you're doing quality theater, well researched uh, before, before starting a project. It's, so well researched, uh, with the support of students, and of course, when when you have students involved, there is uh, uh, it kind of gives you um, it kind of, it, it makes you hopeful about the about the theater that it's going to continue. It's not it's not ending, you know, uh, because there is the next generation that's going to uh, take on uh, after you, you know, and uh, this is this is in my opinion one of the most uh, uh, important things that the theater initiative has done, especially I want to emphasize quali doing quality theater. Um, and I just want to say something that, uh, sorry, I, 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 I just want to say, uh, to add to what Robert was saying, um, and what Sahar was saying uh, previously, is that what, what I've noticed with uh, doing work with Sahar and Robert, um, and to do theater in general is something that, from my perspective, it needs to transform you. If it does not transform you, it does not play a role. It, did not, uh, it doesn't have any significance. Whether you're a performer, a director, like what Sahar was uh, sharing from her experiences, Robert, Nada, May, like, if it doesn't transform you, you know, it's because really I, w I was discussing this with my students the other day that uh, art is the substance of life. Theater, theater is, a, is an art form. It's the substance of life. It's what gives life meaning. Uh, it doesn't give life structure, but it gives it meaning. You know? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and what I've noticed with the translations that Nada, Robert, and uh, Sahar participated in uh, is that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come clean Nada and Robert. <laughs> um, is that when there's a play that's translated, I tend to read the, the translation first, and then later on, I read the original version, because it, it is a new play. It's a completely different play. 
So I, I prefer to treat it as a, as, a, as a new play. And then later on, I go back to the original one. I just wanted to share these two ideas. Thank you. If we can have last thoughts from the three speakers, and anybody else who wants to make a quick last thought. Then have Say hi to Randa and May. Sorry. Speaking of students <laughs> who, are, who are going on, uh, uh, Randa, uh, uh, who worked with us is uh, now working in children's publishing. Yeah, that's that true. It's sort of like that. I, I write curriculum for kids, but a lot of it is media and theater and uh, comic book related, so different kinds of. Yeah. And is you know, it turns out that we have a Brazilian connection, a Portuguese <laughs> language connection. It goes on, and May's here uh, at Cunius of Fulbright this uh, term. Uh, yeah. So, what are you doing? Tell us um, what you're doing. I'm doing my master's in applied theater right now and I'm in my final thesis here and I'm also working around as a teaching and community artist in New York. So so, and you acted in Rituals of Science. I did, we, yeah, 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 yeah. We were, so <laughs> yeah, we were students. And, yeah, so we were both students and um, it was my final year in Tokus at the time I was president of the drama club. But, we, <laughs> but um, hey, so what a, we had different roles and it was really interesting because you, we had, I had the opportunity to act in it um, and also assist with set and just help, just in general, be part of the background, like part of the logistics. And then, um, and then I also worked with them on the rate as a, the assistant director, which is also a lovely opportunity to kind of assist with that and take a step back and kind of look at the directorial decisions made in such a difficult and controversial play. So um, why are you studying theater? Why aren't you going into banking? With <laughs> <laughs> why are you throwing your life away? Yeah. 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 What, what, what is it that inspires you to do this? I mean, we're happy you are doing it, and, and to come to continue studying here. Uh, what, what's the motivation that masochism? Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, so I actually, when I was in AUB, I did my bachelor's in sociology and anthropology. So I was always really interested in just people, like in stories, really, in storytelling. And then I think for me, my medium then became theater. So after that, it was discovering how can I combine theater in all its forms, but I wasn't so much interested in the entertainment aspect so much, but not in the preachy propaganda type either. And I think for me, it was really difficult finding that balance of how can it be from the people, participant-centered, ensemble-based, without kind of enforcing a message on people either. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why, I mean, I, I mean, that's what the journey I'm trying to discover now through AUB and through the um, AUB Theatre Initiative, and I'm currently doing my Applied Theatre Masters, so I don't have an answer yet, but we'll see. <laughs> well, we're glad you're doing it. Lori? Well, it's just, uh, you know, the, the, these kinds of uh, discussions are just so important, the, the, the polyglot, you know, uh, translation issue is just one I just find so fascinating. Um, how the plays, as Sunny said, the plays can be completely different in different languages and, and uh, you know, how many how many words for snow are there in certain languages and non-existent in other languages, you know, this is the kind of thing that I, I think we, we need to be spending more time uh, on as, as human beings um, in this very difficult times that we're in. So I'm so happy to, to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want to say thank you. This has been great. Thanks for the discussion. I'd, I'd really like to say thanks to Frank. Of course. To thanks Frank, to who's Frank. A Frank Hinchker, who's here from, from the City University of New York, and Martin Singh, from the very beginning of this process when we brought um, a rituals uh, on our way to Chicago. He asked us to stop. Uh, uh, he uh, published it in a book called For uh, the Translation, and not done, I did. Um, and it exemplifies theater at its best. Is It's the center of the world theater in North America. It's your portal to the world. And that he included us, uh, he and his colleagues there, uh, Martin Carlson has been incredibly helpful. We have a memorandum of understanding with them. We have, as Sahar said, a relationship with Lincoln Center. Um, you and I are you know, going to go and have a meeting with the producer from the BBC. In other words, this is resonating globally. And we're, uh, I think theater's ironically making AB a much more global university. Look at the diversity question. The language question is one that we're uh, not just a Lebanese and American university, we're a global uh, entity. 
And um, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to people like Frank that have helped to make that possible because they've created this uh, 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 conduit for us to reach out to the world um, and to find out what other people are doing. So um, uh, thanks, Frank. And uh, you know, uh, again, it's wonderful to see that diversity means you know not just. American diversity, it means worldwide diversity, and I think that's why what we're doing is interesting, it's important to education, and changes the experience radically that people have. Well, well just to finish with our thanks, we need to uh, clearly thank AV's president, Fadlo Khouri, because he's the one who helped bring about the theater initiative, or the, you started it, but he helped push it along, I think. Yes. And also, he, uh, President Khouri, is the one who initiated this process here, to have these briefings to link AUB and other people in Beirut with people here and to develop uh, some mechanism for people to exchange ideas and to keep uh, doing it. So thank you to President Khouri. And I mean, We'd like to thank him too. We met with him. He's been unbelievably supportive as has uh, Nadia Sheikh. Who's, uh, it was the a wonderful meeting we had with him yeah, in 2016, February, with Dean Nadia Sheikh. I think both of them are very essential to the... And they come to all of our productions, tweet from our productions, promote it, and the word goes forth that this matters, this is at the center of experience, and this is the problem that frequently theater artists have seen as marginal, marginal ancillary, you know, secondary to banking or, you know, business or whatever, and they are, the message coming from a medical doctor who's the president of the university saying, this matters. This is at the center of what we do here. Um, it means a lot of other people come experience the work and they begin to believe it too. So okay. we're very grateful to them. And we hope that this will, this event today will uh, stimulate the launch of what I would like to make a regular um, process of looking at culture and the arts in the Arab world uh, through the AUB office here in New York, linking to people in Beirut and other places around the region to look at all them, and we just talked about theater today, but and to talk about theater, we talked about writing, we talked about poetry, we talked about translation, we talked about reality, the TV, politics. So when you took all the culture and the arts, uh, poetry, novels, art, painting, whatever, movies, there's such an incredible diversity. And, and arts and culture in the Arab world is the last bastion of free men and women who can say what they want to say and are not totally controlled by the power elite. So we hope that uh, we will look at these issues in a, an ongoing way and connect with more people here in the new world in New York. And lastly, I need to thank uh, the people in New York here at the AV office, uh, Allison, Najib, Justin, uh, Barbara, Ada, and many others who contributed to this, and also Joseph Azar uh, and Salim Kerjajian in Beirut to help uh, put on the uh, event there. And uh, thank you to Sammy and all the others in Beirut. Thank you all here, and that's the end of our briefing. Thank you. Bye. Bye.